Willkommen. Bienvenue. Welcome. Fremda. Étranger. Stranger. Glücklich. Zut sehen. Je suis enchanté. Happy to see you. Bleib resta stay. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. Im Cabaret, oh Cabaret, to Cabaret. Cabaret was one of the last shows that Paul Hughes directed. And he was very proud of that production because like all of his artistic endeavors, he pushed the creative envelope. Today, we are all here to celebrate a few of those artistic endeavors and the stages of life of Paul Lewis Hughes. And in the words of the MC from Cabaret, and on behalf of Paul, I'd just like to say, Willkommen, Bienvenue, Welcome. In Cabaret, oh Cabaret, to Cabaret. Shakespeare wrote, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. Our friend Paul Hughes played many parts. Actor, singer, musician, stage manager, director, producer, writer, composer, designer, philanthropist, chef, world traveler, yes, a chef too, people connector, educator, teacher, mentor, son, brother, uncle, friend. It was in this very chair that he spent countless hours reading scripts, making notes, writing, and pondering his next great adventure as it related to theater, the world stage, and to the many other players that he met along the way. Those many other players include all of us here in this theater today. And today we all play the part of audience. Congratulations, you got the part, well done. My name is Mark Edgar Stevens, and I knew Paul in many of the roles that he played in life. I first met Paul when I was 13 years old, and Eileen Schofield, stage manager, convinced him to cast me as Huck Finn in a produ production of Tom Sawyer at Theater Winter Haven. Now there was a song in that show called Painting the Fence, wherein Tom Sawyer convinced, uh, some of you know it, wherein he convinces all of the neighborhood kids to give up their prized treasures and any other plans that they may have had for a Saturday out in the sun to instead paint a fence for him. The lyric goes, Painting the fence, painting the fence. Nothing's more fun or much easier done -er than painting the fence on a Saturday out in the sun. Tom Sawyer gets the whole neighborhood to come out and work while he oversees and directs the work being done. You know, basically he's telling everybody what to do. And they love it. They have a great time. They're happy to do it. And when I think of Paul, I think about how he got so many of us to eagerly give up our time and in some cases our treasures to come out and have him tell us what to do. <laughs> All those many Saturdays in darkened theaters and we loved it. We were happy to do it. We were so happy to be a part of it and our lives and our worlds were better for this. Today, I'm playing myself and my role is to weave a narrative around the stages of life, of the legacy that is Paul Hughes. 
Along with Debbie Morgan, who serves as director of today's celebration, Eileen Schofield, who served for many years as Paul's stage manager and creative confidant, and Tammy Sarabran, who was the administrative arm to much of Paul's work. Yes, you know what she did. She did everything, folks. Yes, you can laugh at that. Okay. She was his frequent traveling partner, and she was family to him in more ways than can ever be fully expressed and fully appreciated. Thank you, Tammy. We all came together to create a snapshot of Paul's life. We shared so many stories. We tried so hard to remember the timeline correctly. We laughed a lot, and we cried a little bit, too. Now, along the way, we've been joined by many others. And now we are joined by all of you. We're all here today to honor Paul by painting that fence for him one last time. While he watches us silently <laughs> and continues to tell us what to do. In the past month since Paul's death, I thought a lot about uh, how we each serve our purpose. And it's hard to think of a better example of serving purpose than Paul Hughes. His passion and his mission in life connected so many of us, not only here in Polk County, but in theaters around the United States and around the world. Paul's life was always entrenched in the theater, and every theater that he walked into, no matter where it was in the world, became his home. Today, this theater, the Polk Theater, where Paul directed several productions and for a time served as artistic director, is one of his many homes. And just as in life, we are all Paul's invited guests. Today, as his audience, we are the witnesses to the scope of his influence, his work, his passion, and his purpose. The only difference is that today, our friend will not speak and bellow in his larger-than-life voice from that larger-than-life body. Today, our friend will listen and observe as our words and our voices and our applause and our laughter and our tears retell some of the stories of his life and his contributions to our lives. But make no mistake, though our friend Paul is not here today in body, his spirit most definitely is. And believe me, he is still calling the shots, he is still directing, still educating, and he is still serving his purpose. And the legacy of his life will live on, not only through his work, but through his colleagues, his students, his family, and his friends. Nothing's more funner, much easier or than painting the fence on a Saturday out in the sun. There are members of Paul's family here with us today. And that gives me the pleasure to introduce a person who has the distinction of having known Paul for longer than anyone else in this theater today. His brother, David Hughes. Good afternoon and thank you for coming here to celebrate Paul's life and career. I'm David. Um, I was asked to come and briefly talk about Paul's early life and give you a little bit of our family history. To uh, lead into that, I don't know how many of you knew our sister Doris. She followed Paul's career very closely. Um, and she used to come up and visit with us a lot. Uh, we live up in North Florida. And uh, we would start talking and she would get around to telling the history of the Hughes family. So we made a joke about it and called it the, the history of the Hughes according to Doris. <laughs> so I didn't know Paul very well as a, I mean, although I lived with him, I didn't know him very well because I was considerably older than him. And so we didn't really hang out. I just really remember him as being that annoying little brother. Um, but I have some stories to tell you. So we're going to start with uh, Act 1, Scene 1, the early the early years of the Hughes family, according to me. So, mom worked in a musician's factory during World War II, and dad was a soldier in Europe. When he came home, uh, he went to a skating rink and saw this beautiful woman sitting on, in one of the chairs there and decided to show off for her. And he 
got on his skates and he went to jump over a bunch of barrels and he miscalculated, wiped out, and by the time he finished sliding across the floor, he was right in front of mom. The rest, the rest of it is history. Um, so uh, we started out in Illinois and then we moved from there to Atlanta and from Atlanta to Bogota, Colombia in South America, where I guess is when, that's when we first, should have first realized that Paul was meant to be in the spotlight. Um, we were living in this hotel um, called the Hotel Tequendama and we were on the 12th floor. And uh, I didn't witness this, but my mom sure did. She came into one of the rooms and Paul was sitting in the windowsill with his feet dangling out 12 stories high, waving to all the cars down, down on Calle Siete. And um, so we should have known right then that he was destined for, uh, or that he had high ambitions anyway. Um, and then I'm gonna go from there to, uh, to a story that George told me. And George and Paul roomed together. And Paul used to play records and sing along with them, only he would sing louder than the stereo. And there was one particular song that he was played over and over again, it was called in the year 2525. I don't know how many of you remember that, but George said he played it over and over and over and over, working on his voice until George, one day Paul wasn't there, George took a sharp object and scratched up the record so he couldn't play it anymore. <laughs> then uh, um, after that, I didn't have, wasn't around much, but um, we reconnected in college. When Paul was in college, he lived with me in Tampa. And uh, he was a theater major at the University of South Florida. And I would travel back and forth between Tampa and Port Everglades a lot. And uh, I came home one night, it was a Friday night, and uh, all I wanted to do was sit down on the front porch and have a beer. I drive up and there's a party going on. And there must have been 30 theater majors all trying to be the center of attention at the same time. <laughs> and, you know, and he had several of those, but no matter what the circumstances, he always managed to steal the spotlight. Um, and uh, then the next, what's the next story? Next story is also in Tampa. I was the guy who had the pickup truck. So, you know, when you're young and you have a pickup truck and someone wants to move, who do they come to? <laughs> Me, so we were moving a friend of his and uh, she had a piano. And we got the piano in the back of the truck and a few other items. And there are six or seven of those kids piled in the back. And I'm driving through Tampa and they're all, someone's playing the piano and they're all singing th songs and rehearsing for their next show. Um, all the way through Tampa. And I, my biggest concern was I was going to get arrested or get a ticket at least. But it didn't happen. The next story, oh, I, had, I didn't write these down so I had them all listed in my head. And you know when you get old, short term memory starts to have problems. Um, this was, well, forget that and we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> I, might, I might remember it later on. So I had this little apartment in Lakeland near Lake Morton. Um, back in those days, just about everyone did. Well, Paul and his friend and his friend's sister had gone to a movie and they were wanting to go somewhere to hang out. So Paul says, I know, we can go to Dave's house, he won't care. And they were going to, uh, so I came, I'd forgotten something and I came home and here were these people in my apartment uh, partaking of things that belonged to me. <laughs> um, which Paul also said, oh, that's okay, he won't mind. Um, but anyway, so I came in and he was in a heated argument with this, with this girl, his friend's sister. And they were arguing about a movie and she was good. I mean, she was really good and she was beating him and Every, everything they argued about. And um, so I introduced myself to her. And um, next month, that little girl and I will be celebrating our 39th wedding anniversary. <laughs> yeah. So he tried to do something, uh, take something away from me, but instead I ended up with the better part of it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, where is I going to go from there? I guess I should have written all this stuff down. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, 
I didn't know Paul that well as a young kid because I was older. By the time he started his career, which would have been at Crystal Lake in, the, in a chorus, I was already in college. So uh, we weren't really close as kids. We really reconnected as a, as when he was a young adult. But uh, I just want to thank you for coming out and uh, celebrating this Paul with us. And uh, I have one more thing to say. This shirt, can you see it? Really cool shirt. I would give this shirt off my back for someone to donate funds to Paul's scholarship fund. As a matter of fact, I would give Paul's shirt off my back because that's who it belonged to. <laughs> Tammy picked this out for me to wear. So I don't know if you guys saw this. I'm taking my shirt off now. But, woo, yeah, there we go. Can you see that? <laughs> Thanks again for coming out. We really appreciate you. Paul Hughes grew up in Polk County where he attended Lime Street Elementary, Crystal Lake Junior High, and Lakeland High School. Now appearing in his role as Paul's trusted friend from his teenage years, Kenny West. Hi everybody. Uh, so Paul and I met in uh, Lakeland Senior High School. The class of 74, we started as 10th graders and uh, he was my best friend, and we were part of this little clique of friends. You know who you are. We were probably the most annoying clique of the class of 74 at Lakeland Senior High School. Um, not just because we were awkward, but because we really, really tried. We really worked at it. Um, but we hung out. Uh, a lot. We walked all over this town all the time. And uh, in particular, we would walk around Florida Southern College. It's where we did a lot of our uh, singing. Uh, we would get our guitars and go down into the stairwell in the new section and uh, play songs, play Jacques Brel and David Bowie songs. And we would walk all over the campus on the, uh, on the roof of the sidewalks. There was one security guard there who knew us well, actually, because we would see him and he'd see us and we would scream and we would run on the roof to the other side of the campus. And we did, this was, this happened for years, actually. So he knew us well, Pops, we called him Pops. Um, but uh, we, were, uh, we were awkward. I was amazingly thin, Paul was tall and uh, thin. We were all thin. And, and trying to figure out what to do with our hair, you know, Paul, uh, Paul won, I think. But uh, he, he uh, but uh, so, you know, we argued and just experienced a lot of stuff in high school together. And uh, I think uh, one memory that might be important is that uh, I was probably with Paul when we, uh, when we discovered just how loud he could sing in that stairwell over at Florida Southern. And it was awesome how loud he could sing. Uh, and my only regret, regret though was that uh, I wasn't around when he learned how to sing on pitch. <laughs> so, uh, but it's great that everybody came here. I love Paul, my oldest friend, and uh, this is a great celebration. Thank you so much. So after high school, Paul attended Polk Junior College on a full vocal scholarship. Now it was there that he met a theater professor who would change the course of his life, first as a teacher and later offering him his very first directing job. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, that life-altering educator and former producing director of theater Winter Haven was Mr. Norman Small. Unfortunately, Norman could not be here with us today, but he has written a few words about Paul's years at Polk Junior College and Theater Winter Haven that he asked for me to share with you now. So these are Norman Small's words, and they're kind of funny. So he was 18, tall, lanky, and talented. It was the mid-70s, and I got a chance to work with him because someone else wouldn't. How? The story was recently told to me as best as I can remember. I might add, there are many stories told to me that I really don't care to remember, but this was never one of them. Anyway, there was this music student who was about to lose his scholarship because he wanted to do live theater. Imagine that, losing a scholarship for loving Sondheim more than Schubert. See, our music department, department looked at theater musicals as a pathway to vocal hell. So we gave him one, a scholarship in theater, musical theater. That's what we do. Now, he might have written, Dear Music Department Chairman, I am in hell, and I'm loving it here. And he might have added something like, Having to sing and dance simultaneously. Now, this was long before it was Polk State College or Polk Community College. It was just plain Polk Junior College. With all those changes, by the way, I just wanted to call it Polk Community Collage. <laughs> Norman's funny. This kid was no junior. Talented as much as he was tall, Paul eventually took that scholarship during those early years of theater at Polk Junior Community State College to become a scholar of his own. His early theater performances were in the student center. A real theater would appear but five years after Paul left. What a shame. Though he would return later to perform as Johnny Casino in Greece on that new stage, yeah, I know, I'm certain you can see him, greased hair and all, I did. Years before, though, after Paul had helped load the portable stage on which he would be performing that weekend, remember, this was the student center, which was also a cafeteria, which was also a social hall, which was also a theater which was also a problem for the other students anyway. See, one day during a lunch, Paul told me he heard a kid make a disparaging comment about the stage impeding on that previously exalted lunch space. Insult the legacy of Dionysus. From that day on, Paul would refer to the student center as the stupid center. Others had said that before, but that was about the food. During those two years at Polk Jr., Paul would grab roles in The Man Who Came to Dinner, Godspell, and at his finest, he wore that painted face adorned with smirking lipstick as the MC in Cabaret. Liza would have been proud. When he was among the ensemble of those 10 vagabonds in our junior college production of Godspell, Paul would display his skills as singer, improvisationist, and at times in that show, contortionist. He bloomed, he blossomed, he bent. It was hard for me to make that show remain a true ensemble. It was like the first word sung in that song might have been, pre e e pair ye the way of the Paul. <laughs> show him an audience and Paul might say, they are mine. Simultaneously, at what was then Winter Haven Community Theater, Paul was in a show that has the word wizard in the title. This was 1976, and little did we know in the few years to come, he would be performing, directing, and teaching, soon to become the wizard of all. I lost touch with Paul until he returned years later to direct at what was to become Theater Winter Haven. His maiden voyage, receiving his first paycheck as a director, was for our children's academy shows, Hansel and Gretel and the Pied Piper. The kids looked up to him, literally. His first directing job for a main stage show was successful enough as a beacon to the future that perhaps we should rename it A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Paul. He was to appear again in Winter Haven's cabaret, this time as Herr Schultz, no longer the glaring sardonic character who dances with a gorilla, but the tender Jewish fruit vendor who dances with his landlord, Fraulein Schneider, with an accent of love. The gorilla was gone, the talent remained. Truth is, to me at least, together with that sonorous voice and occasional imperious manner, as someone once called it, whether Paul was directing, performing, teaching, or just talking to you, he didn't dare you to listen. He, you just did listen. 
So if you believe in a hereafter, then let me offer this possibility. Our Paul meeting St. Paul, well, who else would it be? Our Paul would have surely been greeted by the words he himself had sung so many times. Appropriate as they are, indeed, St. Paul might have even sung them to him. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. I once asked Paul his favorite play to direct, your adaptation of Hamlet, he told me. Thus, he would have surely known the final words as the ghost of Hamlet's father departs. I repeat them today as Paul might have himself. Adieu, adieu, remember me. We will, Paul. We certainly will. Those were Norman's words, and he would have loved to have been here, and we are so glad to have had Norman Small in our lives. Uh, in addition to Polk Community, yes, thank you. You can applaud for that one, for Norman. That's great. In addition to Polk Community College, Paul went on to attend the University of South Florida. However, it was during his time at St. Leo College that Paul shared his passion for the music of Stephen Sondheim with his dear friend and fellow musician, Patrick Flights. I met Paul at uh, St. Leo College in 1984 when um, I was spending a lot of time in my, um, my room. I was kind of a uh, hermit, and my roommate said, hey, there's a production of a Fiddler on the Roof. You should go audition for it. And uh, so I went, and I uh, auditioned, and remarkably, I was cast in the role of Muttle the Tailor. Uh, in, a, in the production that Paul was playing Tevye, and it was directed by David Frankel. My initial um, impressions of Paul Hughes, as others have said before, he was the, the largest human being I had ever seen in my life. And also, when he sang, when he started singing, I was absolutely blown away by the, the, the volume and just... The, just the incredible sound that he was able to produce. I mean, I know he was a big guy, but, but also, it wasn't, he wasn't just singing loud. He was singing, and it was just amazing. And I know he went on to do two more productions of Fiddler, but I wish you all could have heard him at that point, because it was just as fabulous as the subsequent um, versions of Fiddler on the Roof. Um, I'd like to tell a short little story about our time at St. Leo. In, during one of the uh, during the rehearsal process, Paul invited some of the cast members over to his house, which was off campus. And I was a pretty, pretty green person, pretty um, not really experienced in much. Um, and there was some um, alcoholic beverages there. And um, I just decided to uh, try to drink about six tall boys at this at this party um, and the next thing I knew, knew it was four o'clock the next afternoon and I was lying on Paul's bed which was a giant bed by the way um, it was very comfor comfortable but the story is and I don't remember it is that I got very sick and Paul was holding my head over the toilet for much of the evening after I, um, after I had those tall boys. Well, I mean, the reason why I mention that is that he was very big and very larger than life, um, but he was a gentle giant. He, he cared about people. And even though we had just met, he took the time. He could have just let me 
pass out on the middle of the floor, but he didn't. He let me, I mean, he took me to the bathroom or however I got there, I don't really remember. <laughs> side note, side note, uh, before I got married and I was living in, in Lakeland, there was a restaurant on Memorial Boulevard called Rax, and uh, I had a salad at Rax. I ended up with food poisoning, and guess who I called because I, was so, I thought I was going to die? I called Paul, and he came, and he just sat there while I had the worst bout of uh, food poisoning. Anyway, sorry to share all that in, in detail. <laughs> but another case where, where he, if you needed him, he would be there. Um, St. Leo, it was a place where, where Paul, under the guidance of David Frankel, was free to explore and develop his skills in all aspects of theater. He was a fantastic director and was able to make even unskilled performers look good. One of the productions I remember very well is a production of Mousetrap, which he directed. And I was just blown away at the way he directed the end of the first act, where there's a, mur a murder scene, and he played the music of Rossini, the thieving magpie, underneath it. And it was just, I was just blown away at, at that. And with my love of classical music and, and how he, he uh, choreographed that, that, that killing scene was just, I, I just thought it was phenomenal. Um, yeah, seriously, he's a great director. <laughs> I mean, and I just want to, to end with just saying that if I had not personally, if I had not met Paul at St. Leo, my life would have been completely different because Paul introduced me to his good friend, Bob McDonald, the great pianist um, here in Lakeland, and I ended up studying with, with Bob and going on a career path that was more um, music-oriented, but still with theater as a large part of my life, and also met my wife, Teresa, at St. Leo. So I just want to thank you for having me here today to talk about the days at St. Leo, and I also want to mention that he touched many lives at St. Leo. I don't know if there's any St. Leo folks out here today, but yeah, uh, he has, he you know, spread so far and touched so many people. And those days are really days that I, I cherish and will always remember. And I didn't even tell you what I'm playing. This is the ladies who lunch, I'm sorry. It's the ladies who lunch. And when I started at St. Leo, he knew that I played piano. And when he found out that, he, that I played piano, he brought me this sheet music and he took me to the practice room and he said, you, I wanna sing this song. And he did that with the ladies who lunch. It wasn't even until afterwards that I, that I realized and learned that this was a song that was sung by a woman in the show, but he sang it phenomenally well, as he did with a bunch of other songs that he brought to me at St. Leo. So I did want to share the ladies who lunch with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I, I want you all to know that a lot of people really had to come together to make today's event celebration happen. And we have an amazing tech crew that uh, worked overtime to put together uh, these pictures. And we've created a chronology so that we can give you a full comprehensive picture of Paul's life, yes. So uh, this chronology is Paul's early professional career. And as you watch these wonderful slides, I will let you know a little bit about what happened in between these periods. In addition to serving as a writer and director at the Polk Museum of Art's Summer Theater Program, Paul would later in life go on to perform a one-man show at the Polk Museum of Art titled Vincent about the life of Vincent Van Gogh and a subsequent one-man show titled An Evening of Edgar Allan Poe. During his very long career, Paul also worked with Taproot Theater, 
Lakeland Little Theater, Theater Winter Haven, Bartow Performing Arts Council, Tampa Playmakers, and Ritchie Suncoast. Additionally, Paul worked as an actor and stage manager at both the Mark I and Mark II dinner theaters, earning his actor's equity status when he was invited to become a member of the Professional Stage Actors Union. He went on to work as an equity actor in productions throughout the state of Florida, in Connecticut, and in New York. He followed in the footsteps of many actors before him. He carried on a tradition of theater that goes back to the ancient Greeks, a tradition that he has taught to countless other actors and students, and perhaps one of his greatest acting lessons came from those who worked with and who had the pleasure to see Paul in what was arguably one of his most career-defining, if not most memorable roles, Tevya in Fiddler on the Roof. Paul always worked hard, and how did he keep his balance? That I can tell you in one word, tradition. Throughout his long career, Paul also wrote material specifically for the theater. Among those pieces was a children's theater adaptation of Hansel and Gretel. Ladies and gentlemen, in his role as composer, pianist, and collaborator on piano, Evan Surrency. that you're hearing is from that original production of Hansel and Gretel, written by Paul Hughes and Evan Surrency. The lyrics from this song are particularly fitting for today's celebration. A happy tune for all the world to hear. And this is how it went, my dear. Hi-ho, lodio, I don't care which way I go. To the south with the sun, or the north where wind doth blow. Hi-ho, lodio, I don't care which way I go. In his younger years, Paul often thought about a permanent move to New York City, of course, to continue his career as an actor. But as often happens, fate stepped in. In 1987, as he was packing his bags for a permanent move to New York, he got a call from Karen Prohanich, a parent volunteer, asking Paul to step in as director on a production of Tom Sawyer for Pied Piper Players. Unfortunately, the production's original director, Rick Olivo, had unexpectedly gotten ill. Paul's decision to say yes to that request forever changed the course of his life and the lives of those in the theater community of Polk County. Eventually, Paul became the artistic director of Pied Piper Players, growing a children's theater group into a full-fledged community theater. For 23 years, he served as artistic director and oversaw all productions. He built and designed lights and sets. He managed volunteer crews, acted and directed. And he, yeah, he did, and he did it all with more than just a little bit of help from all of his friends. Now, Paul created opportunities for many up-and-coming theater artists, and some of those artists have very successful careers in the entertainment industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome accomplished visual artist and founder of Pied Piper Players, Mr. Rick Olivo. Uh, it's hard for me to be up here. 
uh, because I have so many mixed feelings and uh, I'm a crybaby, so there goes that. Uh, I have to stick to the script because I'll be rambling forever. One of the things, okay, here we go. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about how Pied Pipers and Paul got together. Uh, Norman Small asked me to see if I could start a theater somewhere other than uh, Winter Haven so that uh, the kids could have more access to the theater. And so I met some parents at Theater Winter Haven that were from Lakeland, and they gave me the gracious invitation to come here. I uh, had to prove myself. I went to uh, Ken Rawlings, who was the director of uh, the Museum of, uh, in Pope, uh, the Pope Museum of Art, and uh, he gave me a letter of recommendation because I worked for him for uh, quite a long time. Then I went to, uh, uh, anyway, I went to the city. And uh, the city decided, wow, we're going to have our own theater. Uh, the parents were very, uh, I would say, rabid, OK? Because we couldn't get in this place the first time that we had to rehearse. and. Uh, we had all these parents waiting over here because we didn't know that the office was over there. And so I said, we can't get into theater. And one of the parents says, could you give me the lock? I said, no, you're going to need a crowbar to get in here. One of the parents opened up her purse and pulled out a crowbar. <laughs> OK? Uh, anyway, that's the way uh, our theater started, with breaking and entering. <laughs> uh, the, uh, let me get back to this because I'll go, I'll go on. Okay. Uh, then the uh, tragic happened. After being with uh, the theater for two years, I developed a heart condition. And uh, the doctor told me that I had three, year, three years to live. So I went for a second opinion. And he said, I had two years to live. So I said, I'm not going for a third. All right. Uh, Anyway, I kind of put my things in order. Uh, I uh, told uh, the kids that I wasn't going to be here anymore. And then I went looking for a director. I wanted someone that was a little bit like me, a uh, little bit easy on the, on the uh, uh, stiff side that he, he flow, go with, went with the flow, and a little bit bohemian, like I am. Uh, I found Paul had done uh, uh, Tom Sawyer. And so I decided, hey, let me go with Paul. And it was a good choice. Uh, one of the things that I want to do about Paul is I want to take him off that pedestal. I don't think Paul would like that. I don't, he was no ivory statue on top of something. He was flawed. He was. Uh, in pain at times, and he was, uh, for lack of a better word, very human. And the man that I wanted to direct my children, my children, had to be human. Because only a human being can understand pain. And he did. Um, there's a lot of things that he did that kind of made me feel a little queasy, but it, again, he, Paul was Paul. I remember one time there was a, uh, a young lady who was doing a part, and he looks at her and says, do you call that acting? Do you call that acting? And then she started to water in the eyes, and he says, go to the bathroom, wipe your face, come back and do it right. OK? That was Paul. And you know what? She came back, she did it right, and he congratulated her. And she was so happy. You have to realize. Uh, the carrot works very well. But out there, if you're a professional artist, there is no carrots. There's only the stick. There's only the professional rejection. There's only the, you didn't do it right. OK, if you did it right, they expected it. They're not going to give you a compliment. OK? And Paul knew that. Paul knew they needed to have that. And I'm, I'm, 
you are better for it. And what I have to tell you is, this is not about Paul. This is about his students. You are carrying his DNA, just like my students are carrying mine. And one of these days, when you're 30 or 40 years old, and you say, what do you call that? What do you call that acting? You're going to hear his voice coming out of your mouth. OK? But it's going gonna, it's gonna to make sense to you. All right? Uh, uh, I don't know if I should do this. Because my daughters always discourage me from singing. Uh, I, remember, I remember I used to sing, you know, because maybe I'd have a part, and I'd sing the part. And I go like this after I finish, and they look at me, and they look at each other, and they say, Dad, those weren't the words. <laughs> you know, that's the best I could get from them. <clears throat> You're going to have to give my voice. I'm a little nervous. I'm a little emotional. <sighs> this is not for Paul. This is what Paul would want me to sing to young act actors out there. It's going to be rough. It's going to be hard, but in the long run, it's worth it. It's worth every moment. When you walk through the storm, hold your head up high, and don't be afraid of the dark. When you walk through the storm, there's a golden light and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the rain, walk on through the wind. Though your seas be tossed and turned, you'll never walk alone. I followed it up, but hey, you get the picture, okay? okay. I love you guys. Okay. Paul influenced many young actors at Pied Pipers, some of whom have built careers that have taken them far beyond Polk County. Ladies and gentlemen, flying in all of the way from Indonesia, Pied Piper alumnus and international educator, Jason Bearhold. Rick just said, uh, your teachers become a part of your DNA. That hit me, man. That hit me. Um, but I'm glad he said it because it kind of it justifies what I'm about to do. Um, when they asked me to speak, they said I could say whatever I wanted or I could uh, just read this thing that I wrote on a Facebook of all places. Uh, and I tried to think of what I should say, but I couldn't really find anything that said what I wanted to say except for this thing that I already said. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of take a second to tell you about Paul by telling you about me. I, uh, I got the news, uh, I think as mo most of us did, by a Facebook post that Paul had passed. Uh, it was a hot day, and I was sitting on the porch at my wife's parents' house. She was wandering in the garden, and I was scrolling. And the news hit me really hard. And I needed to say something. I needed, as trite as this sounds now, I needed to comment on this Facebook post. Um, it sounds stupid, but the, the need was real, so I started typing. And m my wife, who'd only been married to me a few months at the point, uh, was shocked to come up on the porch and find her normally cheerful husband weeping and tapping away on the phone. And she asked what, what happened, and I stumbled on the answer, I think I actually said something like, somebody important to me has died. And she asked who, and I couldn't, I couldn't phrase an answer that fit. So I said, just wait, let me, let me finish this, and you'll understand. And uh, that's why I decided to read this post, because it's, it's an explanation of why I was crying. And I'm going to try to get through it tonight, but I'm going to put that right there. <clears throat> my father was never a part of my life. My parents were divorced when I was an infant. 
and for whatever reason, my father just decided not to be there. When I was 14, and painfully awkward, I had just finished a line which in the wardrobe with Rick, and I was cast as Huck Finn in the children's theater production of Tom Sawyer. I volunteered to help build the set, and Paul Hughes put a tape measure and a power saw in my hand, and he taught me carpentry. At rehearsals, he taught me creativity and confidence. Years later, I made my living as a tourist attraction actor using mostly what he had taught me. Then I worked as a stage carpenter using the skills that Paul had taught me. Then he helped me get a job at Harrison Art Center as a part-time teacher. After a lot of effort on his part, he introduced me to teaching. I used those skills to get a job teaching at a university in China where I spent four and a half years, then Moscow for two years, and for the last 10 years, I've taught English literature and drama at a secondary school in Sumatra. And every day, I think of him, or I use something that he taught me. And I try to be for him what he was to me. I'm sorry, I try to be my students what he was to me. <clears throat> to say that he was my teacher is not even close. I've supported myself and traveled the world and lived my dream using primarily what I learned from this charismatic man. His soul helped shape mine. He did far more for me than my father or any man ever did. When my father died, I didn't really feel sad. Having never known the man, there was, there was no impact. But now, I keep wiping my face, but my eyes won't stay dry. <clears throat> I know a lot of people out there feel the same way about him that I do. And I am most grateful to have had him to be a powerful influence in my life throughout my adolescence and well into my adulthood. Told you. Thank you for being my teacher and my friend and my dad. I love you, Paul. Paul always had an eye for spotting talent both on the stage and in all technical aspects related to the theater. Please welcome lighting protege and professional lighting designer, Tim Linneman. Hello, everyone. Unlike uh, most of the amazing, talented people you're gonna see on the stage today, I normally am not on the stage. Normally I would be in the booth or backstage, and so this is always awkward for me being out in front of everyone, but it was important to me because Paul was very important to me. When I was trying to decide what I was gonna do, um, I remembered that I had written a post for Facebook that I had never ended up posting. I don't post that often, and usually it's just something that's important to me, and um, sometimes it's just cathartic to be able to write something. So I decided what I would do is actually read the post that I had written exactly as I had written it. But then I thought I had a better idea. I was like, you know, I could actually let Siri do this for me. What, what could possibly go wrong, right? So, and then I thought, well, that would be a great comedy moment. But, but instead, it's probably better that I just go ahead and read it to you. But again, this is exactly as I wrote it. So it's kind of raw, but I felt it was important to share. I don't post on Facebook often, but this is one of those times where I must. I needed a few days to really grasp what I was feeling and if it was worth sharing. I only do so as a tribute to the man, Paul Hughes. When I was younger, I had a love of film and photography and immersed myself in it. I had gotten pretty good and started doing it semi-professionally. That led me to my first taste of theater. My cousin, Jeff Lenneman, asked me to come to a rehearsal of the show that he, was work, uh, that he was doing and photograph it. That show was a funny thing happened on the way to the forum at Winter Haven Community Theater. Paul was the director 
and it was his first main stage show there. And even though I had not been a part of that show, I immediately felt a sense of belonging and community. That was 1982. Following that, I did some promotional shots, some promotional headshots, which all actors need, for Paul, and we spent the rest of the day talking. Even then, I was amazed at his larger-than-life presence. Paul was the kind of friend that was always thinking of others rather than himself. I think that is one of the things that I, that I was always amazed by, the fact that he could go through life thinking of how he might help or enrich the lives of others. When I started doing lighting, Paul gave me so many opportunities to light his shows, and he truly was a joy to work with. He had the perfect balance of knowing the direction of the show, but allowing the artistic freedom for me to be a part of the evolution of it. He set the bar very high for other directors who followed. There are so many wonderful and special moments of Paul, but there is one that keeps coming to the front of my mind. While I hesitated to share it here, I will. I was going through one of the most difficult times of my life. I was in a tremendous depression. I just bought an older fixer-up home, and my projects were sporadic, which left a lot of time on my hands. I locked myself in that house and simply felt sorry for myself for several days. Paul, knowing what was happening, and upon attempting to call me numerous times, with his calls and messages going unanswered, showed up at my house. I ignored his numerous knocks at the door with him stating quite loudly who he was. I just didn't want to socialize when I was in such a depressed state and wallowing in my own pity. Well, Paul wouldn't take being ignored. He went to the side of the house and started throwing acorns that had fallen from the tree on the side of the house. And he threw them up to my second floor window where he knew my room was. This went on for quite some time. I had hoped he would eventually believe I wasn't there and leave. He didn't. He finally yelled up in that booming voice of his that he knew that I was there and, he wouldn't, and that I didn't want to talk, but that he wasn't leaving and he would keep throwing acorns until I came down and let him in. Given that ultimatum and concern of what my neighbors thought about a tall, gregarious man yelling outside my house and throwing things at it, I acquiesced. We talked for a couple of hours and he let me cry, be angry, and feel everything that I was feeling. He stayed and listened. He provided guidance that I used to get me through that difficult time. I follow much of that life guidance to this day. He convinced me to get out of the house and we went to dinner and he made me laugh for the first time in weeks. That is what a true friend is. A friend doesn't give up on you. A friend doesn't leave when things get uncomfortable or might take too much time. That was Paul. At least that was Paul for me. I know many, many others have their own stories that demonstrate that Paul knew better than most of us ever will how to be a friend, even when it is uncomfortable and hard. Life is never easy, and helping each other make it through this crazy life is all we have. Paul intuitively knew that. It was in his DNA. It was in his soul, and it is who he was. As I say goodbye to Paul, my heart hurts knowing that I was not nearly the friend to him that he was to me. I wish I had the strength to be there for him, even when it might, uh, might have been uncomfortable. He leaves behind many people who love the man and who owe who they are to him today. From those who have gone on to Broadway to those who simply gained confidence in themselves and their abilities by his encouragement and guidance, everyone he met was touched by him in some way. As my sweet friend Jamie Beasley said when we were talking, it's like he lived multiple lives at the same time to be able to give so much of himself and his time and be so influ influential and important to so many people. That is such a true statement. As I read the tributes and know firsthand some of the stories of things Paul has done for others, I'm struck again that he focused so much of his energy on others. As we say goodbye today, Remember that there are others that we can help and change the course of their lives for the better. Be like Paul. Thank you. There are a great many memorable productions and musical numbers that Paul staged for the theater over the years. One that was arguably a turning point in the developmental growth of Pied Piper players was Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. From that production, singing Any Dream Will Do, original cast member, Chris Holcomb. Back the curtain. 
Someone was weeping, but the world was sleeping. Any dream will do. I wore my coat with golden lining, bright colors. was waking and dream will do a crash of drums a flash of light my golden coat flew out of sight the colors faded into darkness I was left alone Pied Piper players eventually became Lakeland Community Theater, and when it came time to turn over the reins of artistic director to another great talent, there was one very natural choice. Accomplished actor, director, scenic designer, and sometimes mistaken to be Paul himself, Lakeland Community Theater's artistic managing director, Alan Reynolds. The first time I encountered Paul Hughes was over 40 years ago in Hazel Haley's advanced English class. <laughs> he was performing with the group called Taproot. I remember he was bigger than life and loud. And he had such a stage presence that filled the room. My next encounter with him was not too long after that at Polk Community College where we shared a stage in a production of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead. We had uh, several conversations during that production where I discovered that he was just as outspoken, snobbish, and opinionated as I was. <laughs> Needless to say, we became fast friends after that. Over my career and lifetime, I have never collaborated in the theater more with one single human being than Paul Hughes. Paul's many talents and gifts will be exalted here today by his many friends, colleagues, peers, and students gathered, which is only fitting and proper. And I could stand up here and give you a list of the numerous great shows that he directed, produced, starred in. They would be notable. But today, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to reflect on Paul, the Paul that I knew, the human being, my friend Paul. Now, Paul was a fantastic cook. His baked brie was to die for. His dinner parties were culinary ex experiences, events. And when you came down with the flu or a bad cold, there were many times he would show up on your doorstep with a pot of hot and delicious, healing, homemade chicken soup. Yes, sir, that was really good. He also, like me, loved a big bonfire and indulging in a, a few libations, sitting around poking the coals and just talking. He was gifted with a devil's wit that I admired and was, as you all know, a great conversationalist. 
I remember one evening we were planning on going out and Paul had dropped by my house to pick me up. Uh, but my dad had called me a bit earlier and reported that there was a cow in our back field that was giving birth to, the, to a calf, but the calf was breached. Both mom and the baby were in trouble and he needed help. You know, Paul, without hesitation, stayed that entire evening with us. And by the time we'd finished, we were both covered with mud and other items I don't want to mention. But you know, Paul was the kind of friend that was willing to get filthy with you, for you, staying to help out a friend. You know, Paul was fun to hang out with, too, and a, a great travel companion. But there was always a caveat. You had to make sure that he had his wallet. Yes. I had the pleasure to go with him to the Fringe Festival in Edinburgh, Scotland. And once we arrived, we discovered that our luggage had been lost. Paul immediately went into action, you know, only as Paul could. He got on the phone demanding money for an entire wardrobe for both of us from the airline. And of course he got it. With limited time, the clerks at Marks and Spencer's, after finding out the amount that we had to spend, opened up private dressing rooms for both of us. We were throwing clothes back and forth like schoolgirls, trying on designer prom dresses. <laughs> we arrived at home, and our bags were snugly on our door doorsteps. They had spent the entire trip in Heathrow but made it back home safe and sound. We scored two wardrobes that trip. Uh, Paul visited me on location in the Bahamas while I was working on a film. So that evening after he arrived, we hit the blackjack table, but I had an early crew call that next morning, so I left him to the table to his own devices. When my alarm went off at 4.30 a.m. to get up, I sleepily looked over to the bed next to me, and it was empty. There was no Paul. And then I began to panic, thinking about all the scenarios that happened to him. But as soon as I panicked, I heard the key slip into the door of our bungalow, and there was Paul, dragging in with a tired grin on his face, bragging that he had cleaned up at the blackjack table, made enough to pay for his trip, and much more. When Paul came on the set with me for a tour, everyone on the crew thought he was my brother. And like was mentioned, I have spent my entire life, adult life, especially when I had hair, being mistaken for Paul, which could be considered a gift or a curse, depending on the circumstances. But there was one time while we were out together that he was mistaken for me. <laughs> and finally it happened. I just busted out laughing and he gave me this look, needless to say he did not appreciate my amusement <laughs> for that reversed recognition. Paul was a gifted artist who loved fine art and he had a, he had a great collection if you ever saw it. He was very proud of it. He was the kind of friend that if I commented in passing how much I liked a certain piece of art, I would find him the following Christmas at my door holding it with a bow stuck on it, saying something like, you said you like this one, so here. Oscar Wilde once said, I regard the theater as the greatest of all art forms, the most immediate way in which a human being can share with another the sense of what it is to be a human being. Paul Hughes shared with myself, my family, and all of us what it is to be a human being. And he was an exceptional one indeed. Godspeed, my brother and my dear friend, Paul Hughes. 
In every production, Paul always had a trusted team by his side. One of those people was his dear friend who became extended family. They spent many holidays together and they planned numerous trips to New York City for Lakeland's theater-loving community. In the end, she was the person who Paul requested to be his personal representative. She was the one who knew where everything was in Paul's life. Ladies and gentlemen, former executive director of Lakeland Community Theater, Tammy Sarabrin. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, or as my grandkids were calling him last night after meeting him once, Uncle Mark. <laughs> Paul Hughes was a very special part of my life and my family's life for over 30 years. He was a theater colleague, friend, and yes, he was like family. He joined with us to share in our many family life cycle events. All of his friends and students, too, were so important to him and he to them, as is evidenced by those of you out there who traveled here today from as far away as Indonesia and across many states in the United States. The tributes posted on Facebook and given here today are evidence of the love and respect you all have for Paul and his work. As late as today, when somebody RSVP'd to the Evite that was out on Facebook, a former student from the community theater said, knowing Paul had such an impact on my life, I moved away from Lakeland many years ago, but I couldn't miss this chance to express my gratitude. I can assure you that if you ever sent Paul a Christmas card, wrote him a letter, sent him photo cards of your families at the holidays, gave him a birthday card, sent him an announcement of your baby's birth, he still had them. There are hundreds of letters, cards, and postcards, and baskets and boxes in his house. The fact that you communicated with him in writing was very, very special to him. My seven and three quarter year old granddaughter, who came here from California with her parents and brother for this event, asked me last night if Paul had any children. I responded that he had many thousands of children. His children were all those students he nurtured and encouraged over 40 years of teaching. All those children and young adults he came in contact with through his school outreach programs, directed and guided through production after production in the schools where he taught and the community theaters where he worked. He helped many a fledgling actor come out of themselves, become more accomplished on stage than any of them would have ever thought in their wildest dreams they could. I always marveled time after time when I watched him direct how he reached these kids and drew out from them more than they were ever thought they could. The day Paul passed away, his brother David asked me if there was an, any favorite charity that I thought Paul would want people to make donations to if they wanted to contribute something in Paul's name. I said I knew that he personally contributed to several organizations, but I thought that if Paul could answer that question, he would say, create something that will help a child or student who might not otherwise be able to afford it on their own to nurture their love for live theater. David thought that was a good idea, so then I called Alan Reynolds, who you just met, to see if the theater could create a Paul Hughes Scholarship Fund. Alan was very accepting of that idea, and that is when the Paul Hughes Scholarship Fund at Lakeland Community Theater's Eunice Fuller Theater for Youth was established. The goal for this fund is to raise at least $10,000 toward it so that it can go into a trust with the local community foundation, GiveWell. The GiveWell Foundation is a 501c3 public charity serving Polk, Hardy, and Highlands counties, and it holds more than 300 charitable funds established by individuals, families, private foundations, and organizations like Lakeland Community Theater. The Paul Hughes Scholarship Fund would be one of the funds the foundation invests money for, and the theater would use the interest it makes each year to pay for student theater scholarships, allowing the principal amount to be kept intact so the Paul Hughes Scholarship can continue into perpetuity. So, if you are one of those people out there whose letter or card Paul kept all those years, or you are a former student of his who was like one of his children, who he cared for and nurtured so much, if you are one of those people who sat in the audience and enjoyed the product of his directing or marveled at his acting and her singing talents, if he impacted you in any way with his talent and personality and friendship, or if you appreciated what he has given to us here in Polk County, then I encourage you to make a donation to the Paul Hughes Youth Scholarship Fund 
no matter how big or small, so Paul's influence in this community can be carried on for many, many years to come. In the, playbill, in the program that was handed out to you today, there is an explanation of ways in which you may contribute. If you wish to leave something today by cash or check, there is a basket at the back of the theater. By the way, that was Paul's basket, to put that in. If you wish to mail in a check, the address is in the program. And if you wish to contribute by credit card, you may do so by going to Lakeland Community Theater's website. Paul, most unfortunately, left this world too early. But with the help of your generosity, you can assure that his light in Polk County still continues to shine bright. Thank you. When Harrison School for the Arts opened in 1989, Paul joined the staff as the acting instructor and later became the head of the theater department, where he taught acting, directing, and playwriting. Through the years, he was instrumental in building a nationally recognized theater program, and as a result, Paul was recognized with numerous awards and accolades. Ladies and gentlemen, in their roles as students and friends, Layla Spatani and Jared Massey. Bear with me, I'm very emotional. Lord, I don't wanna do the ugly cry, here it goes. I was just doing some of Paul's acting warm-ups backstage because it always calms my nerves. I'm sure you guys remember Door Table Wheel. That one really gets me comfortable. Remember that one, Jared? Oh, it's hard for me because Paul had a profound effect on my life, and I loved him so much that it's very hard for me to put into just a few minutes of what he meant to me, but I'm going to try, and I'm going to try to get through it without crying too much. But I can still remember the day that I met Paul for the very first time. I was a student at Harrison, and he came walking into our acting class, and he was wearing rope sandals and baggy pants and a t-shirt. And we were all like, oh my god, this guy is so cool. And he was. He was like really cool, that total bohemian. Um, but we also realized very soon that he was a master artist, and we were so lucky to be learning from him. And I learned so much, and I had such tremendous respect for him. And when I graduated Harrison and I went off to college, I kept in touch with him. And I contacted him when I booked my first equity play. He was one of the first people I called. And of course, he was so happy for me, and he actually made the trip down to watch me perform. And he would come down to watch me perform a few more times. And during that time, I started to feel this shift from him being my teacher to being my friend. And I even said to him, I said, can I call you Paul instead of Mr. Hughes? And of course, he said yes. But it was so cool to be able to call him Paul finally. Um, and in 2007, my husband, Andrew, and I started a family. And we had our first son, Taylor and then my second son, Dylan, and my relationship with Paul continued to evolve, and I watched him become Uncle Paul. <sighs> There's that ugly cry again, stop it. <sighs> he was so wonderful with them. I've been living in New York City ever since I graduated college, and Paul came to the city a lot. And every time he came, he always reached out to me. And we saw, have so many, so many memories of being together in New York. But Paul's absolute favorite memory from being in New York with me was the snowstorm of 2000. He was staying with me and my husband in our apartment, and we woke up that morning. <sighs> to just massive, massive piles of snow outside. <sighs> Sorry, Paul, <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> oh, so we got up and we bundled up and we ran to the park, Central Park, and we played like little kids. It was so much fun. We made snow angels and we got in random snowball fights with strangers and we laughed and it was just, we had the time of our lives. Well, the last time I saw Paul was Thanksgiving, this past Thanksgiving, and he brought up that memory during dinner. He said, that still is by far my favorite New York memory when we had that snowstorm in 2000. And I was like, I think I have pictures somewhere. And we went digging through a box, and I found pictures from that snowstorm. And we flipped through, and we laughed, and we reminisced. 
<laughs> and when I was preparing for today, I went digging through some more boxes because I wanted to find some of these great pictures to share. And I found a letter I completely forgot that he had written to me back in 2000. It was after I had come down to Lakeland to teach my first acting for the camera workshop at Harrison. And I must have expressed some kind of frustration with him about my career at the time because he wrote me the most wonderful, wonderful words of encouragement. And I just want to read that part because I feel like it really embodies who he was as my friend and as my mentor. So I'm just going to read this bit. I know you were concerned with this being your first wor workshop. Don't be. You were a real hit. Congratulations. I also enjoyed spending time with you. Your company, whether in New York or here, is always such a highlight to me. I truly love sitting on the porch and just talking. I hope you will take my advice and reflect positively on where you have been and where you are now. Your accomplishments are tremendous. I can honestly say that I am very proud of you. You exemplify what sacrifice, hard work, talent, and dedication can do. I know that the next step is just around the corner. Use this time to take a breather. You've earned it. His words were exactly what I needed to hear then and now. So I'm so glad I found that letter. Paul was my mentor. He was my friend. He was my family. And I'll miss him forever. But I'm so, so, so grateful for the lifetime of memories that we share. I'll treasure them. Thank you. Am I there? Oh, hi. That was beautiful. Uh, it's hard to have action with what the heart's in denial of. So I, uh, I didn't write this until 3 a.m. this morning. <laughs> That's my excuse for being a bad student. <clears throat> I'd like to start with a quote from Jack Kerouac. The only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. The ones who burn, burn, burn like a fabulous yellow Roman candle. One more quote, just because I like this. Charles Bukowski. Some people never go crazy. What truly horrible lives they must lead. If I had spent the entirety of my life setting pen on paper, I feel I would still not have mastered a way to capture the love, the gratitude, and the reverence, the unwavering faith I had in this man. <laughs> he was my father, and he was my origin story as an artist. Actually, I'm pretty certain this is where we were visiting Layla at this time, this picture was taken. And uh, I'd like to think that this was a time we were cheersing because I was announcing after he had taken me to see several shows, I was getting over some difficulties in my life at the time, this was just four years ago. And uh, I told him that I was going back to acting. I'd like to think that this is that photo, but we cheers many times in many different places. And I'm not exactly sure if this is the one, but let's just pretend it is. It was definitely my father. Uh, there was a combination that I feel sorry for anyone who didn't feel of embarrassment and pride when I would hear, Jared, take your father out of here. He's too drunk to do karaoke. <laughs> it was the ultimate advocate for the misfit. In many ways, he was the man exactly that I wish to be someday. A poet, well-traveled, well-read, and well-respected. And for all the, his shortcomings or imperfections, still beautiful. He was the man that I wanted to dedicate and share every single win and accomplishment with. It's hard knowing that he won't be here in physical form to do that with. 
Um, but I still will. I will lovingly place him in everything I create until my last day when I reunite with him and say, you are right. I could do it. <laughs> they say a man dies twice, once in the body and twice when the last person says his name. But there's a lot of people here, so I'm pretty damn sure he's immortal. <laughs> And if you say his name or you find yourself speaking to him and he doesn't answer back, don't be upset. He's just silently correcting your grammar. <laughs> I love you, Paul Hughes. My life in the world will never be the same without you. And for everyone else who felt he was as a father figure to you, um, as he certainly was to me, that I am your brother, and I want you to know that. Let's all be advocates for the misfits, the outliers, and the dreamers, the creators. Let us all honor him with our work, our creative endeavors, and most of all, with our truth. Thank you so much. Hello, my name, is, my name is William Bowles, and I did accidentally mess up the order here. Um, <clears throat> I was an indirect student of Paul's through my time at Harrison and Pied Pipers. As much as it's been hard to find the words to share today, the one thing that I knew that would be quite a gift to me is to look out at everybody here um, and, can, and just, you know, recognize all these people who... Paul's life had had an effect on, and to be in this beautiful theater that he loved. My earliest memories of Paul go back to Pied Piper players. I was in middle school, having recently moved from Indiana, and with begging pleas, I convinced my mom to sign me up for summer theater camp. It was my first exposure to theater, and I fell in love. I eventually auditioned for Winnie the Pooh the following season. I'm talking about the production where Jared Warner played Eeyore. Oh, whoa, that, I didn't know that was gonna be up there. Um, we need to get some pictures of Jared as Eeyore. At that time in my life, I didn't really understand how theater worked, so I was surprised that I didn't get a call back from the theater telling me which part I got. So I called back and left multiple messages. I eventually got a call back from Terry, T Tammy Sarabrin telling me that there were no ro roles left, but that I could work backstage. <laughs> so my, I, I was very happy to do it, and my main responsibility was to move a tree stump on and off stage, downstage left, and I thought it was the coolest thing. <laughs> I remember watching from the wings. I remember the smell of the theater. Theater became my safe space, and it was in those moments that I caught the theater bug, as they say. The year after my fancy debut backstage, I was cast, to my delight, in the role of John Darling in Peter Pan, directed by Mary T. Albright at Pied Pipers. Paul played Father Darling and Captain Hook. I remember him as a really intimidating person, but gentle and very mysterious. Throughout high school, my interactions with Paul felt somewhat secondary since I was a musical theater student at Harrison and not under his direct teaching, so I'd mainly see him at Pied Piper's, which had become a place where I spent a lot of time. My friendship with Paul really began after college when I returned back from Lakeland from the University of Central Florida before eventually going to grad school in Chicago. I had moved on from being a performer and graduated with a BFA in set design. I was thrilled to return back to Pied Piper's to design a couple shows and to cross paths again with Paul. He eventually asked myself and Steve Smith to go with him that summer to Stockholm, where he was directing a production of The Fantastics with the Stockholm Vocal Academy. It was an ambitious opportunity for me to have an international credit and to collaborate with Paul as I was going to design the scenery, lights, and costumes. Um, I'd never really designed costumes and lights before. <laughs> 
um, and Steve was going to be our stage manager. I think it's fair to say that both Steve and I really didn't know what we were doing, but we certainly felt the gift of the opportunity, and it made the experience feel special to be entrusted with the project. Our trip that summer in Sweden was truly life-changing for me. I'd only traveled once internationally before, but this was at a different point in my life where I started considering the idea of accepting myself. We put on the Fantastics in a shoebox of a theater in Gronelund, a near 150-year-old amusement park in the heart of Gamlestan, the old, country, the, the old city in Stockholm. The theater had a tiny proscenium, only about 10 feet tall by 12 feet tall, or 12 feet wide, painted candy apple green, green scavenged from a, a king's palace. One time while I was working in the dressing rooms that were located in the loft above the theater, I could overhear Paul working with some of the students during the rehearsal. The students were in high school and didn't have any formal theater training prior, and it was clear that they were engaged with Paul's attention. Part of that is, I think, that while teaching, he demanded your attention. And I think that's why so many of his students respected him, because he challenged them to be their best, even if they didn't even know what that meant for themselves. His dynamic presence created a standard of excellence and respect that I'm sure every former student sitting in this theater has felt the influence of. It was my first time being able to objectively see his talent, not from the point of view as a student, but as a fellow artist. That summer with Paul and Steve was an adventure and a coming of age for myself. The mysterious person of Paul I had understood prior was now alive and free in what felt like the endless golden hour days of midsummer. He loved to drink and he loved to sing in bars. He was young and free, or at least that's how it felt to be in his company. Still though, there are so many sides of Paul that I didn't see. As the years passed, we'd always make an effort to meet up during Christmas, and he came to Chicago several times to see various productions I was designing. I was always thankful for his support and welcomed his company. Forever, Paul seemed like an endless going of energy, but through his last few years, I saw a change in his pace, and, the experience, and I experienced the realization that even your heroes are human. During his last visit to Chicago, to see a production of the producers I designed, I knew that this trip was going to be very different, as he had trouble making it up the stairs upon arrival to my apartment. He pressed on, though, and saw the show, and now it's such a gift to have been able to share that time with him. I'll remember Paul Hughes as a very generous person, a kind person, the life of the party, a nonconformist, a, pro a profound educator, a person who made a difference in my life, and a friend. Thank you. In 2005, Paul accepted a position teaching acting and drama classes at All Saints Academy. In addition, he became the Director of Fine Arts and expanded the school's fine arts program for both the middle school and high school. Ladies and gentlemen, in their roles as All Saints Academy graduates, Chandler Holmes and Aaron Henricks. Hi everyone, I'm Chandler. I graduated All Saints in 2008, but that's not where I first met Paul. I met Paul sometime in middle school through my friendship with my now fiance, Samantha Morgan, and her mom, Debbie. Paul was one of the earliest champions in supporting me and my photographic work. He recognized talent in me early on that only a few others had. He recognized it wasn't about the camera, it was about my vision. This wasn't in theater or his line of work necessarily, but it made sense because it was well within his reach. At times it seemed there wasn't anything out of reach for Paul. We all know he could have been a famous Broadway star should he have chose that route. Uh, instead, he chose to fulfill his life by leaving a lasting impact on others, which we can all agree he did. I'm a testament to the fact that his impact wasn't limited to theater or art for that matter. I went on to work in the tech industry and Paul continued to show his support. In recent years when he would come to New York City, we would always get together for a few drinks. Sam and I loved those visits. His outlook did seem to shift the last few times I saw him 
and not because he wasn't proud of what he had done, on the contrary, because he was, I believe, still longing to continue building. It's so easy for us to take direction and advice from someone who's so talented when it's right in front of us, but it's hard to remember to pay it forward. There was a feeling in those last conversations I had with him that he did have regrets. I think he would want us all to not worry about what you might regret and focus instead on how you avoid regrets in your own life. When you look at your life as a puzzle, you think about where those pieces fit and how you find the right ones. And you know, he had friends in every kind of place from every walk of life, and he managed to impact them all. I, I would say that he was most proud of that. I, I certainly admire that trait of his the most, his ability to connect with anyone. When you talk to Paul, regardless of who you were or what you did, he listened intently. He was theatrical and his presence larger than life. But when he asked about your life, it was sincere and it was anything but theatrics. He certainly did have many stages in life, and the constant was his compassion for all people. His journey isn't over, it's living in all of us now. I think Johnny Mercer may have said it best with his lyrics for Moon River, and I quote, we're after the same rainbow's end, waiting round the bend, my huckleberry friend, Moon River and me. Onward, Paul, my huckleberry friend. My classmates and I first met Mr. Hughes when we were just starting middle school. We were small, nervous, and quiet. He was big, confident, and quite loud. <laughs> Despite our differences, though, Mr. Hughes quickly became one of our favorite teachers because when you stepped into his classroom or his rehearsal, you had a feeling that you had escaped that you no longer had to be burdened by school stress, teenage drama, personal insecurities. Mr. Hughes simply had no time for such things. We were too busy putting on a show. And for a class that often felt more like a return to recess than an academic course, we still really did learn a lot. We learned how to work. Mr. Hughes demanded your best and would let you know if you weren't giving it quite loudly. He showed us that passion isn't just a feeling. It requires time and effort. We started to care more because he cared so much. And we hung on to every word that he said because we knew it would make us better. The big things and the small things. Whether he was teaching us how to deliver Shakespearean monologues or explaining that to us just exactly how the funniest part of the body is the butt. We learned also how to act, and I don't necessarily mean in the theatrical sense. Mr. Hughes would often tell us during rehearsal, I don't care what you do, just make a choice. This was a, a pretty radical, this was a pretty radical idea for the hesitant, overthinking, anxiety-ridden group of young people that we were. <laughs> he made us take risks and then live with the consequences. If it didn't work, he'd make us try again and again and again. He understood that on stage and in life, indecision was not going to get you anywhere. And finally, and I, I know how cheesy and sappy this might sound, but he taught us how to love. I'm sure everyone in this room could look around and find a lifelong friend that you formed around Mr. Hughes. I don't think that's a coincidence. He gave us permission to be ourselves around each other without fear of judgment, to feel joy and sadness out in the open. To Mr. Hughes, everyone had a part to play. Everyone had something of value to bring to the stage. We all felt that from each other and most of all from Paul. In this sense, we, we, we didn't just perform for him. We didn't just learn from him. We grew up with him. And we were so lucky to do so.
In addition to the pieces that Paul wrote and directed, such as Hansel and Gretel and Camp Buster, there was a show that he loved staging year after year during the holidays for the students of both Polk and Hillsborough County titled The Gift of the Magi. Many of those productions were performed right here on this stage at the Polk Theater. Over the years, productions of Gift of the Magi were seen by over 200,000 students. Think about that. Over 200,000 students got the gift of live theater because of Paul Hughes. There, yes. <laughs> There was this one particular song from that show that Paul always loved, no matter how many times he heard it, titled, Your Hair is Gone. It brought him so much joy, and he would run around saying, Your hair is gone, your hair is gone, your hair is gone. And it's basically, it's the moment in the show when Jim discovers that his wife, Della, has cut her beautiful hair, and he goes stark, raving mad. Here to reprise their roles from Gift of the Magi, Teresa de Souza Flights and Benedict Heaps. Your hair is gone. Please don't be mad. Your hair is gone. Does it look bad? Your hair Let is gone. Your hair 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 is gone. Yes, every tress. Your hair is gone. Is it a mess? Your hair is gone. 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 Could it be he's lost his mind? He keeps repeating what he says. The influence of Paul Hughes extended far beyond Polk County. As an actor, director, and educator, Paul worked in a variety of places across the United States, most notably in New York City. Here today in the role of fellow world traveler and dear friend, Mr. Rick Van Belser. Your hair is gone, your hair is gone, your hair is gone. Follow that. Your hair is gone. Oh, as sitting out here in the audience when Tammy was up here, I totally lost it because Postcards. Paul used to travel all over the world, and I had an uptight postman. Paul used to send me postcards from all over the world that were X-rated. <laughs> True. If it had boobs, butts, or penis, you could bet I got it in the mail. <sighs> Where to begin? With a breeze. That's Paul. 38 years ago, I was 19 years old, and uh, I was treading water with no plan, no plan whatsoever, until the day I, I auditioned for uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. And uh, this was the moment, the moment that changed my life. 
uh, I was cast as Miles Gloriosus. And uh, if you don't know the show, my character uh, is tricked out of his virgin bride, but as a consolation, gets the Gemini, two beautiful twins. The twins were played by Laura Doty and Sally Wheeler. Fast forward a few years, Laura and I would get married. Yeah, I did finally get the girl. Uh, Paul would sing at our Christmas Eve wedding, and for every year after that, no matter where he was in the world, he would call at the stroke of midnight and sing, Oh Holy Night. <laughs> I will miss that. Paul would share with us countless Thanksgivings and Christmases in New York. New York, it was his second home. And there's way too many st stories to share. Uh, but one time, uh, Paul saved my butt. I was organizing a showcase for a children's musical called The Dinosaurs Come Clean. And I hired five actors. Uh, I hired the venue, the musicians, and all the bells and whistles. But in the end, I didn't have any money left to hire a director. So Paul, on his own dime, jumped in, flew up to New York, and just put on the most amazing show. And I thank you for that, Paul Hughes. Over the years, Paul's students and friends, they'd moved to New York. And uh, he also brought up Lakeland theater enthusiasts to see Broadway shows. And you know, he truly was the Pied Piper. We always urged him to move to New York. We'd say, Paul, come on, move to New York, get out of Lakeland. You're so talented. New York, New York is where you should be. But in truth, Lakeland was where he found his success. Every student he taught, every actor he directed, every play he produced, and every stage he graced, his success is unmeasurable. In the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, we all know George Bailey, who stays in his hometown, and he changes the lives of hundreds of, of his fellow townsfolk. Well, so did Paul do this for Lakeland. Paul, you opened my eyes to the arts and most important to possibilities. And I look back at that 19-year-old me treading water and I thank you for throwing me a life vest. To the gods of comedy and tragedy, Please welcome our brother Paul to your eternal stage that he may look down upon us still and direct us all. Laura, Laura and I are going to miss you, you big mook. We love you, and we will never forget you. Thank you. Paul also worked on productions in the Czech Republic, Italy, Japan, Scotland, and in Sweden, where he spent many summers teaching and directing as a guest instructor with fellow educator and friend, Robertino Walker. During one of those summers, Paul mounted a production of The Fantastics. Joining him in that production in Sweden was singer, actress, and musician, Frida Soderdahl. Hi everyone, my name is Frida Söderdahl and I'm going to talk to you briefly about Paul's work in Sweden. Um, as a teenager uh, living on the uh, island of Åland in the Finnish archipelago, I met a person who would come to change the course of my life quite a bit. Um, and that person was not Paul, actually, not yet. I will get to him. That person was Robert Scott Walker. And in 2006, I uh, decided to join his vocal academy in Stockholm. And the following year uh, is when I met Paul. And um, I've actually just always known him as Paul. He was uh, pretty shocked that... Um, None of us students in Sweden had the uh, good manners to call him Mr. Hughes. Um, but 
We explained to him that in school, we generally call our teachers by their nicknames. So I guess Paul didn't seem so bad then. Um, although on a few occasions, uh, I did call him and I don't know why, probably to see if I could maybe piss him off a little bit, but I called him Polly Boy. Um, he, he hated it, so only a few times. Um, our first big project that we did was a cabaret-style show that we did at the um, historic uh, Granalund Theater in Stockholm. Um, a lot of Sondheim, obviously, all the classics. They had uh, Into the Woods and Company and Sweeney and Follies and all of it. Um, and that's also the first time I uh, ever performed a monologue. So I went from zero to Paul Hughes, essentially. Um, and it was from Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, um, a Maggie monologue. And part of my, part of my business was brushing my hair. Um, and in a rehearsal, I grabbed the brush and I did, I did this. Let me show you. And I brushed my hair out like that. And he stopped me and he said, what are you doing? There is no sense of beauty in brushing out the tips of your hair. Um, so that was probably my, my first lesson in sense of beauty and sense of ease, uh, which would come up a lot later. Um, and then he probably followed that up with, I'm not yelling because I'm mad, I'm yelling so that you'll hear me. Um, which, which also proves the... Uh, teacher DNA theory, because um, I have definitely said that to my, to my actors on occasion. Um, the last project we did in Sweden together was a Fiddler on the Roof workshop, um, where he uh, treated everyone to his rendition of If I Were a Rich Man. And um, I don't think the Swedes had ever heard anything quite so loud. And um, th there's an unspoken rule in Sweden uh, that's called jantelagen, um, and it basically is the idea that you're not supposed to shine too bright. You, uh, you're not supposed to be better. You're not supposed to think you're better than anyone else. Um, so you can imagine the uh, impression that Paul made on the Swedes. Um, and there was... Um, there was a mutual love story a little bit between Paul and Stockholm. Um, whether he was uh, performing a big song like that or um, entertaining the commuters on the subway with his um, didgeridoo mouth sounds that he kind of perfected, <laughs> perfected in Stockholm. Um, or singing at open mics uh, or just having a lot of deep conversations in bars. Um, but all that aside, what was um, inarguably our most important work together was our beautiful production of The Fantastics that uh, William Bowles spoke to earlier. Um, we returned to uh, the Grana Lund Theater, which is right here. You can see the, the green color there. Um, and I had the privilege of playing Louisa in that production. Um, and that, that credit is still very much on my resume at close to the top, and it will probably be there for forever um, because of all the, the lessons I learned from that time. Um, so in honor of, of that time in my life, I'm going to sing a, a couple of verses of Try to Remember from the Fantastics. Um, and there may or may not be a little bit of a twist to the second verse. We'll see.
For his work and contributions, Paul received the Polk County Schools prestigious Hall of Fame Award, the Florida Theater Conference's Distinguished Career and Secondary Education Award, and in 2018, Polk State College's Distinguished Alumni Award. Today, Paul receives another honor. Here to present Paul with a posthumous award from the Polk County Arts Alliance, Cindy Rodriguez. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cindy Rodriguez, executive board member of the Polk Arts Alliance, which is Polk's art, arts agency. On behalf of our board of directors and our executive director, Mary Mass, who was unable to attend today, I'm honored to present the Polk Arts Alliance's sixth annual Artist Hall of Fame Award in memoriam and celebration of Paul Hughes. In presenting this award, we join you all friends, family, and the community as a whole by honoring Paul, who clearly dedicated his life to the arts in Polk County. We've heard about his legacy as a teacher, a director, a playwright, a visionary, and a performer. And we recognize and thank him from the bottom of our hearts for so generously giving his time, talent, support, and passion to building and enriching the arts for Polk County residents, visitors, and especially for his students. In addition to today's recognition, Paul's legacy will live on at the permanent Artists Hall of Fame display located at the Polk County History Center in Bartow. The exhibit is on the second floor of the um, museum in the history of arts and culture room. And I certainly encourage everyone here to, to take an afternoon and go check that out and, and see the company that, that Paul is in with the other five inductees to the Hall of Fame. His accomplishments will also be memorialized on our website at polkarts.org where he joins really just a handful of others who have been inducted as a recipient of this prestigious award. It has truly been an honor to share in this beautiful celebration of Paul's life, his amazing life. While, and while Paul is and will be continually missed, he will truly never be forgotten as his legacy that he leaves through his life's work will surely live on in and beyond all of us. Accepting this beautiful award this evening is Paul's great nephew, Everett Reed. I look like Annie. Um, <laughs> so, although for most of my life I lived about five hours away from my Uncle Paul, I always felt really, really connected to him. I felt connected to him because of our shared taste in Sondheim. Uh, I felt connected to him because he was so good to my mom and made her into the wonderful woman she is today. I felt connected to him because my current acting coach actually was taught by him at Harrison Arts over 20 years ago. Um, but mainly I feel connected to him because of our shared love for the arts. It's, it's really rare that you find somebody who loves are just as much as you and especially somebody like that in your own family. Uh, so I'm just really grateful for everything he did for us. I'm grateful that uh, that connection doesn't leave with him and that I have the opportunity and we all have the opportunity to carry that with us. So on behalf of his family and uh, everyone here, I would just like to accept this award. Thank you so much. In Paul's last days, he had many visitors, both by phone and in person. The last person to share a conversation with Paul was former Harrison student and Pied Piper alumnus, Austin Corley. Hello. I'm just going to read it. I think it'll be a lot easier. Uh, I went to visit Paul a few times when he was in the hospital. That I know of, while he was still conscious, I was the last person to have a conversation with him. For some reason after that conversation, I decided to write down what he had talked about, and this is what I wrote. 
Wednesday, I had to wake up and head to the place to bring Paul a smoothie. The day before, he canceled the smoothie for a trip to Walmart. He asked for uh, the largest sweatpants you could find. He was always cold. I picked two smoothies, and he picked peaches and silk. He said to me, next time not to get that one. <laughs> we talked about his death. He was aware it was happening. He told me about his DNR. We would stare out the window uh, without this great view. And he said to me, I watch people smoke cigarettes. What a joy. <laughs> At that time, an employee, this really, this was crazy. An employee began chasing after this garbage can that was going down a ramp, just filled with slosh, whatever they were serving that day. Uh, slop was everywhere. We laughed and I closed the blinds and uh, I said, lunch is on its way. He wanted to get out of bed to listen to the elderly sing karaoke. I, uh, I asked him why. He said he wanted a good laugh. <laughs> I, um, I, we, we were talking about what musical, uh, what musical he would direct for the nursing home theater that he was going to start, and uh, how many understudies we would require. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We laughed about his death. Uh, he had a sparkle in his eye, um, this, this reflection of, of everything. I didn't like the place he was in. He shared a room with another sick gentleman with a curtain in between. Uh, Tammy brought in one of those claw things, extensions, uh, that told me to give it to him, and uh, he used that. Uh, to open the curtain to his left, uh, he thought he was so clever, annoying the guy next to him. <laughs> Uh, we laughed. His, his laugh was childish, and mine was much bigger. Joe stopped by in full uniform, gun and all, uh, and the staff thought they were coming to get Paul. That was also enjoyable. Um, he gave me all of his personalities uh, those last two hours. I uh, kissed him on his cheek and jokingly said, I'll, uh, I'll see you in the next. Um, after high school, we were friends. I always thought I'd write a book called uh, Wednesdays with Wally. I'm sure he would not enjoy that title. And that's what he did. He critiqued me, and uh, I did my best. And I, I think uh, what I can say is uh, to Paul, uh, drop me some pennies, and uh, I'll see you in the next. Now, here to lead us all in a candlelight toast to the life and legacy of Paul Hughes, actor, toastmaster, and friend, Mr. Tim Williams. I'm tired. These are not my words, these are Paul's. Uh, these were uh, the words of a 31-year-old Paul um, every Saturday morning between 8 and 9 as we built sets for the Pied Piper Player shows, he would show up in his shorts and sandals or his sneakers with a stubble and a, a cigarette in hand, a 36-ounce cup of coffee, bags under his eyes, and he would announce, I'm tired. And this man had every reason to be tired. I mean, at 35 years old, he was the artistic director of Pied Piper Players. He was also a teacher at Harrison Arts Center. Um, he was giving acting classes. He was writing shows. He was producing shows. And as we've all heard from most of the people in this room, he was giving of himself every single day. That's what he did. He was just a burning flame of energy, constant, seemingly endless energy, because he was an artist. He was one of those people that could not get enough of anything, and he could not give enough of everything. And so he was always striving and pushing 
and cheerleading. And it was inspiring. I worshipped that man. The first time I saw him, I was 10 years old, and he came into my fourth grade class to do improv with Taproot Theater. I took acting classes from him at 11. I was in his production of Tom Sawyer at the age of 14. At 15, I was his assistant director. Can you imagine? I mean, not just, you know, being a 15-year-old and I'm assistant directing a play, but also being yelled at <laughs> and told what to do along with all the other actors. I want to tell you two short stories uh, about my time with him, though, as an adult. Because while I worshipped him as a child, and as Rick Olivo said, thought that he stood on this pedestal, it didn't occur to me until I was an adult that he was human that he was just like all of us. He exposed me to some music, um, David Bowie, <laughs> Jefferson Airplane, and I was very excited because I asked him if he had heard Radiohead. <laughs> and he had not. And I said, check out this album, you'll love it. And so he did, he listened to it. And when I went over to his uh, home, this was in the early 90s, when I went over to his home uh, 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 for dinner, he said, oh, oh, Tim, and he got his guitar out. And he said, um, this album is one of the most extraordinary things I have ever heard in my life. And, and the lead singer, the lead singer has an angst and expresses a pain in his voice that I have not heard in years. And hold on, hold on, this is my favorite, this is my favorite. And he sang in his bellowing, nasally, beautiful voice, I'm a creep. I'm a widow. What the hell am I doing here? I don't belong here. I don't belong here. And 20 years later, he came to see a one-man show of mine, and I was really nervous because I had seen his one-man show, Vincent. And I was so nervous that he was going to be in the audience and he hadn't seen me perform in quite some time and I did it and uh, when, the, when the play was over there was a talk back that he stayed for and a, a woman in the uh, audience of the talk back said my goodness that was extraordinary how do you do all of those accents and how do you move from character to character like that it's just it's, it's, it's astounding and I said it's funny that you mentioned that because sitting here in the third row is the man who taught me how to do that. The man who taught me everything I know. All of the energy, all of the expression, all of the, the pain and the joy that you saw on this stage tonight were inspired by that man right there, Paul Hughes. And two years after that, at lunch, Paul said to me, um, I just want you to know that what you did at that talk back meant a lot to me. And you have to understand that he had always made me feel special. He was always giving to me. But right here at this lunch, in this moment, this was one of the first times that I felt like I was making him feel special. That I was making him feel like he was not a creep or a weirdo and that he belonged exactly where he belonged. And he told me, what you said meant a lot to me, more than you will ever know. 
And I'm serious, I'm serious, Tim. I love you, I love you, I'm serious. <laughs> he was surprised, he was humbled, he was deeply touched with what seemed like a revelation to him. And I'm listening to everyone here in this room, and I saw on social media what an impact he had on so many people's lives. My story is just one of hundreds, thousands of lives he's changed, hearts and minds that he's molded. And if, and if there was a genie in a bottle and I had one wish, I swear that wish would be, Paul, I hope, I hope you knew that. I hope sincerely that you knew in the bottom of your heart that people loved and appreciated you. You have candles? I want you to take these candles. There's a switch on the bottom. You can turn them on. And what I'd like to do right now, if there is anyone here who never had the chance to tell Paul one more time, or not at all, that their lives were profoundly affected by his voice, his touch, his talent, knowledge, and indefatigable spirit. Do it with me now. Please raise your candles, and in a moment of silence, let this man know how much he was loved, adored, and appreciated by all of you. I love you, Paul. I'm serious. No, I'm serious. Thank you. Paul had a dream of creating a theater community of the highest caliber here in Polk County and of training students who could carry that dream forward into the world. Throughout his life, Paul traveled extensively to visit his former students and friends to celebrate their successes as they worked as actors, directors, designers, stage managers, and writers, both in regional theaters and in Broadway productions. Additionally, Paul's students have gone on to work in the film and television industry uh, he even has students who have followed him, his footsteps and have become educators themselves, carrying on Paul's dream, his legacy, and his love for the theater. One such person was his student from Harrison, Quentin Darrington. Quentin is now a mainstay on Broadway and in Broadway tours, and for a short while he worked with Paul as an educator at All Saints Academy. Quentin now teaches classes to young actors through his workshops with the Broadway Dreams Foundation. The student actually became the teacher, the legacy, and a reflection of the man who inspired him and taught him. A song that Paul assigned to Quentin was The Impossible Dream from Man of La Mancha. It was also the song that Quentin sang to Paul as he and a few others stood by Paul's bedside just before his death completing a tableau of the valiant knight, fulfilling his mission, surrounded by those who, in the end, have no choice but to agree to believe in his impossible dream. Ladies and gentlemen, the student, the teacher, the legacy, Mr. Quentin Darrington.
can't you see you belong to me I'm a poor heart aches with every breath you take if there's to be anything said of about me and Mr. Hughes is that I am his son. That's it. I'm the epitome of everything that he worked for and gave and loved and dreamed of and his students. It's been 30 years one of the coolest things about tonight is that I know I'm not by myself. My brother Jared and Jason, all his sons, and there's so many more, his sons and daughters. It's a blessing to honor him tonight with you. It's been so hard. I haven't been able to really look at him pictures or read anything that you've written or but God gave me this gift and um, God gave me this father and God gave me a door to travel this whole globe and teach just like he taught and so whether it was we're in New Zealand or China or Germany or Brazil or Moscow. All the thousands of students, my students, they all know his name. We begin every class understanding and remembering and knowing who Paul Lewis Hughes is and why it matters. I thank God for this gift of theater. This refuge, this safe place, this haven, this way that we communicate with the world and prayerfully make it a better place to live in. I thank God for giving me him so that I can, in my part, help make the world a better place to be. Everything I do is for him and because of him so that your life is better. I never could get to call him Paul. He'll always be Mr. Hughes for me because of the great respect and fear. <laughs> that I carry to this day. So just like all of my students all over the world, I would love if you would honor me right now. And on the count of three, speak very boldly, loudly with love and integrity and beauty and strength and triumph. Those three awesome words that God gave us and captured one of the greatest angels he ever gave to this planet and Paul Lewis Hughes and say his name just as boldly and brashly as he would want you to on the count of three. Say it. One, two, three. Every breath you take Every move you make Every bond you break Every step you take I'll be watching you Every single day, every word you say, every game you play, every night you stay, I'll be watching you. Oh, can't you see? You belong to me. I'm a poor Every vow you break, every 
smile you fake, every claim you stake, I'll be watching you. Since you're gone, I'll be lost without a trace. Dream at night, I can only see your face. I look around, but it's you I can't replace. I feel so cold. those last breaths um, I'd never been in a room I'd never been in a situation to care and love in that way and, and I value so much these breaths that we take and I know Paul would appreciate me saying this to you his hope, my hope for every single person in this room is to live, 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 live your life without fear, without shame, unapologetic, live. That's our charge to the family, to friends, teachers, students, live and continue to love with every single breath that you take. Now, no one up here knew that I was going to be singing this song, um, but I did that for Paul. As a 10th grader at Harrison, he did introduce me to this great song called The Impossible Dream, and that song has become the anthem of my life because of what it means. And, um, and I simply want to, again, sing it with everything I got for the man who meant everything to me. To dream the impossible dream. To fight the unbeatable foe. To bear with unbearable sorrow To run where the brave dare not go To right the unrightable wrong To love pure and chaste from afar to try when your arms are too weary to reach the unreachable star this is my quest to follow that star no matter how hopeless no matter how far to fight for the right without question or pause to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause and I know if I only be true to this glorious quest that my heart will lie peaceful and calm 
when I'm laid to my rest and the world will be better for this that one man scorned and covered with scars still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable store this is my quest One man scorned and covered with scars Still strove with his last ounce of courage To reach the unreachable Thank <laughs> you. 